to start talking about the groundwork. We'll talk about the preface today, maybe just touch on part one. Um, so for Friday, we'll, we'll be talking much more about part one. You should finish reading part one for Friday, even though we're probably not going to finish it. The groundwork, you remember, was published in 1785, and to orient yourself, this is right in the midst of the unbelievably productive period in Kant's life. It was after the publication of the People Feel Reason, uh, but before the second edition of that. We don't actually know too much about the composition of this work. Kant was certainly thinking about these issues for a long time. He has lectured on ethics over a period of many years. Um, and his views developed and changed over that period. But he was working on many other uh, issues as well. It's important to remember that the groundwork is, as its title announces, just the groundwork. Um, it's the preliminary statement and investigation basis for what he intended to write as a more complete account um, uh, of his ethical theory in um, a book called In Metaphysics and Morals that he mentions in the preface here. And as you know, Kant did go on to write such a book in two parts. Uh, the first was um, called The Doctrine of Right. The second was The Doctrine of Virtue two books that combined were the metaphysics and morals. And this wasn't written for another 14 years after the groundwork, 14 unbelievably productive years. Uh, and so it's not surprising that his view changed somewhat over that time also. Still, the groundwork is recognizably a groundwork to that view. It's obviously the uh, same uh, person same general outlook, even though some details change. Okay, so the preface. Um, I'll be talking about page numbers from this edition, but you see in the margin, there's also these numbers 4 colon 387. So that's the standard way of referring to Kant's texts. Um, those are the volume and then the page in a standard So the preface starts in volume four, page 387. Uh, and he says, um, ancient Greek philosophy was divided into three sciences, physics, ethics, and logic. And this division into these three parts comes about as follows. He says, um, next paragraph, all rational cognition is either material, and consider some object, formal and is occupied merely with the form of the understanding of the reason itself. So the form, this formal philosophy, the idea of the science of um, reason itself without regard to what the reason is about is logic. So formal science of reason itself is logic. And then investigations into Determining objects come in, and the laws that govern those objects come in two forms, depending on what the investigation is of. If it's investigating the laws of nature, then this is physics, natural science more generally. And if it's laws of freedom, then it's ethics. So he says, Formal philosophy is called logic, whereas material philosophy, which has to do with determining the objects and the laws of the subject, is once again twofold. For these laws are either laws of nature or of freedom. Investigation of the laws of nature are natural science, physics, and the other laws of freedom is ethics. Okay. Next paragraph. Logic, he says. Um, can have no empirical 
So logic, because it's just concerned with the form of understanding, is purely a priori, uh, not empirical. But by contrast, this is important. Um, Natural as well as moral philosophy can each have its empirical part, since the former must determine the laws for nature as an, ob as an object of experience, and the latter for the human being's will, insofar as it is affected by nature. The first, the laws of nature, natural science, physics. The first, as laws concerning Sorry, laws according to which everything happens, everything experienced, is governed by natural laws. The second, reality, laws of freedom. The second, as those according to which everything ought to happen, while still taking into consideration the conditions under which, quite often, it does not, in fact, happen. Um, okay, so natural science, physics, Obviously, Kant thinks, has an empirical component. Obviously. Um, we can't determine what the natural scientific laws, the laws of nature, are um, without uh, empirical investigation. It's important to see, though, that Kant thinks ethics also has an empirical part also has an empirical component, although he hasn't told us what it is. At this point, all he's saying is that the laws of nature investigated by natural science uh, give the laws according to which everything does happen, experience happens. The moral laws give us an account of what ought to happen, even though sometimes it doesn't go that way. <coughs> Um, so let me anticipate just a little bit. It's going to turn out that moral principles for Kant are principles of practical reason as applied to human beings. So moral principles are principles that we get by applying the ideas of practical reason to us. Uh, and this means that there are these two components. The derivation of the principles of practical reason themselves, that's going to be, for Kant, as we'll see in a minute, pure a priori. But then, the way in which they apply to us human beings depends in part on us human beings. Depends on the empirical conditions that we find ourselves, uh, under which we find. So there's going to be an empirical component based on, you might say, human nature, based on what, in fact, human beings are like. Uh, now, these pure principles, the principles of practical reason themselves, these, Kant wants to say, hold for every creature, every being, that has practical reason. Every being that has an autonomous will. Any being that can act for reason. Um, and so in, in that sense, the principles of pure practical reason are not dependent on any empirical conditions about human beings. They apply to any creature, any being, that has practical reason, that can act for reason. Uh, and therefore, they, those principles can't be tied to empirical conditions about one kind of creature or another. Um, we human beings, Kant says, do have practical reason. We do have an autonomous will. We are able to act for reason. And so principles of practical reason apply to us. But we are imperfectly rational. We 
human beings don't always act on the basis of uh, what we have reason to do. We have empirical desires, empirical inclinations, which may or may not themselves be rational. And so we human beings are tempted to act on the basis of these desires, these empirical pulls, these empirical uh, urges, even when, let me start that sentence again, we human beings are tempted to act on the basis of these empirical desires, even when they are contrary to what reason tells us to do. Um, so, we human beings are imperfectly rational, and there are obstacles that we have to overcome, namely some of our desires and inclinations, in order to act on the basis of practical reason, as we should. Okay, so for the human condition, there are these two components, namely the pure a priori principles of practical reason and the empirical, the empirical desires and inclinations based on our material nature, uh, our animal nature, I'd say. Um, and so you can see that ethics is going to take in, is going to have to take into consideration both of these components. So there's going to be a pure and an empirical part. Okay, so metaphysics uh, is the Principles of practical reason, pure practical reason, apply to imperfectly rational beings with empirical limitations, that's it. With empirical desires and limitations that tempt us away from pure practical reason. Okay, so metaphysics um, is the investigation, he says, of determinant objects of the understanding. Um, down at the bottom of that first page still. Um, oh, sorry, it's the top of uh, page four. Um, and so there are two kinds of metaphysics corresponding to the two kinds of laws, a metaphysics of nature, a metaphysics of morals. And the empirical part, as I've just been saying, of ethics, he says, is called practical anthropology. So that's the empirical study of human nature, the empirical study of our natural inclinations and desires and human condition and psychological upbringing. Um, so anthropology for him is not the study of exotic cultures. Anthropology for him is the empirical study of human nature, something like that. Um, sorry, and, and the end of that sentence, crucially, and the rational part of the metaphysics and morals is, uh, the rational part actually, he says, moral science, or maybe morals, strictly speaking. So, let me say one more time, uh, something like a full metaphysics of morals, is going to require two components. One, a pure a priori investigation into the same pure a priori principles of practical reason, together with an empirical study into human nature to understand the obstacles and limitations of those principles as they are applied to us. So this is still 388. Okay. And seeing as how there are these two components, 